Seventeen fishermen lived on the two kilometre strip of Fisherman's Bend, known as the Bend, prior to World War I. The Bend constitutes the coastal fringe running from the mouth of the Yarra River along to the old Prince's Pier in Port Melbourne. Leonard Duggar Beasley is a descendant from a long line of fishermen and mariners who established themselves at the Bend and later in Port Melbourne. Duggar's grandfather George was a fisherman. Duggar's father Len Oppie Beasley was also a fisherman and started fishing at the age of 10 in 1929 and left school at 13 to work alongside his father as a full-time fisherman. George Beasley, Oppie and Duggar were mostly mesh netting in the early days from double-ended boats between 22 and 28 feet in length. Oppie explained why the double-ended net boat was the preferred type for mesh netting in and around Port Melbourne. Double-enders were used in the bay because when hauling nets in and over the quarter, they were a lot better than a square sterner. A boat with a square stern up into the wind would slap the water when she rolled and throw the spray everywhere and the nets were inclined to catch on the corner too. Fishing has been part of Duggar's life from the time he was born. He eagerly gave up school before the age of 14 in 1954 to accompany his father out on the bay. At the time, the legal age to acquire a fishing licence was 16, yet Duggar managed to attain a special licence at only 13, making him the youngest fisherman to have a licence in Port Phillip Bay. Duggar and his wife Frances have worked as a team in their fishing business since the day they were married, with Frances handling much of the day-to-day -day sale of fish, mainly made up of snapper, whiting, rock flathead, mullet, trout and brim. They do this from a shop that was originally owned by earlier members of the family and located underneath their house in Dow Street, Port Melbourne. Duggar can vividly recall the highlights of his time fishing, with his largest catch over three tonne when he was with his father. Where the fine school is, there's a, a reef there called the Shea Reef. Anyway, we went there this particular night, we shot our pike nets out in the reef, and uh, I had my father with me, and uh, I had a mate of mine, and he had a couple of rods. And uh, we had some nice fresh pulchards and that, so he, you know, when we stopped, he chucked his lines in, you know, and I thought, he's wasted his time here, because if you looked at the bottom, it was like corrugated iron, you know, it was just hard sand. And, uh, but I never, I just let him go because it would keep him out of mischief. But anyway, we were only there for 10 minutes, and by this time, it was getting dark. And uh, all of a sudden, these two rods took off. One of them went overboard, you know, and we, you know, looked over the side and couldn't see nothing. So I said to him, so get the spotlight, the water was like glass, I said, and have a look. You might be able to spot it on the bottom, we can hook it up with a grapple. And we, got the, we got the spotlight and put it out, and when we put the spotlight on, all, all there was underneath the boat was thousands and thousands of big snapper, like that. And uh, they were all heading from Point Cook down towards Werribee, and they were packed like sardines, like a tin of sardines, you know, just all alongside one another all heading in the same direction, you know, and it was literally, not hundreds, but thousands of them. Everywhere you looked around the boat was the same, it was just a packed massive snapper heading towards Werribee. And it was roughly 7.30 when the sun was setting, and we sat there till 10.30 and the battery went flat, and, and they were three hours, they were passing through there for three hours. And next morning, um, we went out and picked our pipe nets up and we got 70, 70 big snapper in the pipe nets. You know? But I'd never ever seen anything like that before. That was thousands upon thousands of snapper. The difference between then and now 
is that in the old days, fishing was a lifestyle lived at a subsistence level. Today a fisherman can catch a lot more fish and have a better livelihood, but this means there can't be as many fishermen. Declining fish stocks in the bay and increasing bureaucratic interference in the fishing industry contribute to the continual decrease in the number of Port Phillip Bay fishermen. Dugger feels that the constant need to be out on the water before dawn, day after day, is a real test of character and one of the major trials in a fisherman's life on the bay. Fishermen feel they must rely on experience and a good deal of common sense if they are to survive long in the industry. For a fisherman on the bay, the most dangerous situations arise when a person becomes separated from their vessel. The time in particular we got thrown out of the David's Tinny. One morning down uh, Lara, we were on our way up to Point Wilson. It was freezing cold. It was the coldest June day for 25 years. It was the second last day in June. And uh, he was standing in the stern with his hands in his pocket with a tiller between his legs. And anyway, we're going along and, and it was, uh, the wind was westerly and it was drizzling rain. And it was bitterly cold. And uh, the boat, boat run down a sea and it broached went sideways and one minute I was standing there like that the next minute it was boat it was up on its side like that and I hit the water and I went down and uh, I was sinking down feet first and I thought to myself shit you know I'm gonna drown there and, uh, and uh, I've got to do something about it but I thought if I go up the bloody boat's gonna cut me to pieces you know with the propeller the boat was going around and around in circles up on top of me and I thought to myself, well, if I keep going down here, I'm going to drown, so I'm going to have to take a chance on it. I reckon I was about 10 foot down. So I pulled myself up to the surface, and I got to the surface, and what, what, when I got up there, the boat was crabbing away from me. So anyway, I come up, and I was expecting David to be in and pull me out the water. I looked in the water, he was about 20 or 30 feet away from me, and I thought, what are we going to do? And I looked around, I saw this pile in the water and, and it's on the end of a reef there. So I decided to swim towards that. It was 7.30. And anyway, um, when, when we reached the uh, pile, it was 9 o'clock. When we went down the boat ramp, um, Andrew's car was there. That's my nephew. And we thought he might be there somewhere, but we hadn't seen him. So anyway, we thought we'll wait there for half hour till 9.30. If there's no sign of him, we'll attempt to swim ashore. So anyway, we were hanging on there and it was getting close to 9.30 and we we're just about thinking about trying to swim for it. In the meantime, the cold had got at us and um, we saw him coming, but he wasn't coming towards us. He was heading straight for the boat ramp at Lara, but he spotted the boat going round and round in circles. So we went over to it and uh, then we seen him coming straight towards us, you know, so he came over and he pulled us out of the water and he took us back to Lara. And when we got back to Lara, you know, I climbed out of the boat on my hands and knees. I couldn't stand up. But David, he, he just, he was laying in the bottom of the boat. He was stuffed. They had to carry him out. And while we were there, the ambulance turned up and the bloke, bloke took me by blood pressure and, and I told him about the uncontrollable shivering what it is he said it's your body closing down he says you're dying he said he, he said an hour hour at the most he said you'd have been dead he said uh, he said what what would have happened he says you, you'll stop stop shivering he said you just go to sleep and when you go to sleep what you do you sink you drown mm. uh, that's how close we were to dying you know Up until recent years, there were over 100 professional fishing licences for the waters covering Port Phillip and Western Port Bays. Today, there are only 42 and only two professional fishing licences in the Port Melbourne area. Government officials have stated 20 million will be allocated to halting commercial netting in Port Phillip and Carayo Bays over the next eight years in the hope it will increase recreational fishing numbers and economic activity, with the allocations providing a clear and fair exit strategy for commercial license holders. 
Like many fishermen before him, Duggar enjoys building and restoring boats during lay periods, so he is never idle. Duggar has restored many of the boats his family fished from and still maintains them for traditional sailing and fishing purposes. If he is not fishing, he is sailing or can be found hard at work on a new project, restoring or repairing a wooden boat or repairing nets in the backyard or on the street outside the shop. Duggar works with the time-honoured traditional materials of wood and copper that were still common at the time of his great-grandparents. Leonard Duggar Beasley has been fishing Port Phillip Bay for over 60 years. With the impending new changes to fishing licences, Duggar may be the last of an era of traditional fishermen in Port Phillip Bay.